The program will now begin. Hello, and welcome to today's event, Women and Girls as Agents of Change in Climate and Con Climate-Related Conflict. I'm Alain Revere, and I direct the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. We're very pleased to be able to host today's event on the sidelines of the UN Commission on the Status of Women with the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations, as well as the permanent mission of Fiji to the UN. As I think we all know, climate change is the existential threat of our time. Weather is becoming more extreme from severe droughts to devastating floods. Climate change is a security issue more and more. Increased temperatures, water scarcity, parched lands, are robbing people of their livelihoods and driving them to abandon their, their homes in search of arable land. There is growing competition for diminishing resources, leading to greater instability, fragility, and even conflict. This year's CSW is calling for greater attention to the gender dimensions of the climate crisis. Women and children are indeed the most vulnerable, but women aren't just victims. They are critical to climate solutions, to adaptation and mitigation, just as they are critical to peace building. Our Institute at Georgetown is actively engaged on this topic through research and advocacy, putting a spotlight on women globally who have valuable expertise to offer policymakers they are the leaders on the front line. Our latest report on the climate gender conflict nexus can be found in your chat box. And we welcome all of you, some thousand who are joining us today on the Zoom platform and on Facebook Live. Many have already pre-submitted questions, but you can raise questions at any point during our discussion using the Q&A feature on your screen. I want now to turn to John Gilroy, who is the lead official in the climate and sustainability, for climate and sustainability at the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations. He has been a champion for inclusive climate policies for Ireland in the Security Council, and previously was posted to the UN as part of the Irish team to co-facilitate negotiations on the 2030 Agenda and SDGs. He has also worked on human rights and gender equality. We had hoped to have Ambassador Bernason, who is the permanent representative of Ireland to the UN with us today. However, she has had to confront the tragic news of the loss of her deputy perm rep Ambassador Jim Kelly. And we join with everyone at the Irish Mission and, and Jim's family and friends uh, on the loss uh, that everyone is feeling today. Uh, and with that, we will now turn to John. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, and thank you for those, for those very thoughtful words. Um, so good morning and good afternoon to, to our audience joining us for this CSW side event on what's a very critical topic. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Mission of Ireland, uh, the Mission of Fiji, the Georgetown Institute um, of Women, Peace and Security and Sir Optimist International. Um, Ambassador, as you said, unfortunately, Ambassador Byrne Nason can't be with us today. We had the terrible news at the mission overnight that our Deputy Permanent Representative, Ambassador Kelly passed away suddenly. Uh, we're all very much in shock here, and the ambassador needs to be there for, uh, for Jim's colleagues and family at this immensely difficult time. Um, she asked me to step in this morning for this important event, and while I'm a, a very poor substitute, Jim no doubt would have wanted us to still continue with our discussion today. I had the honor to work with Geraldine during the two years uh, she chaired the CSW, and I've seen firsthand the transformative energy that the CSW can generate. It's a time for member states, for civil society and partners from around the globe to come together in solidarity and to share best practice and learn from each other. I know today's event will add to that energy. The theme of CSW 66 is examining gender equality through the lens of climate change. 
the environment and disaster risk reduction. For Ireland, as an, as an elected member of the Security Council, we wanted to view these topics through the lens of peace and security. This has brought together two key priorities for our council term, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the issue of climate and security. There are some who ignore the evidence and persist in questioning the need for such topics to be addressed in the context of peace and security. But as they continue to stall progress, women all over the world aren't waiting for permission to act. They are already in action, doing the work and pushing for change. We must join with and support them. There are significant synergies that exist across the work of the UN. Delivering on the WPS agenda can enable climate resilient development. And as the recent IPCC report on impacts adaptation and vulnerability noted, risks to peace can be reduced by supporting people in climate sensitive economic activities and by advancing women's empowerment. For today's event, we're delighted to welcome three excellent women peace builders, Nizreen from Sudan, Horera from Afghanistan and Sophia from Kenya to share their experiences working at the intersection of climate, gender equality and conflict. We are also delighted to have with us Ireland's Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications, His Excellency Eamon Ryan and Mary Robinson, Chair of the Elders, as our keynote speaker. And I'm also very pleased to be joined by dear friends of the Irish Mission, Ambassador Bravir of the Georgetown Institute, who will moderate the panel discussion, and Ambassador Prasad of Fiji will conclude today's event. Um, so I'll hand it back over to you, Ambassador, and uh, you can say a few words of introduction to Minister Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, and now we do have uh, the pleasure of uh, hearing from the Honorable Eamon Ryan, Ireland's Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications and Minister for Transport. Minister Ryan has also served as the leader of the Green Party since 2011 and was twice elected to the De La Grande, the uh, Irish Parliament from the Dublin Bay South constituency. Earlier, he served as the Minister for Communications, Energy and Natural Resources, and he's founded a cycling tourism company. He's worked for E3G, a Europe, European climate organization, and has held several other positions. He has had a long time commitment to addressing the climate crisis and promoting accessible and sustainable transportation. And last year was awarded the Green Leaders Award. And um, Minister Ryan, we are so pleased to have you with us today uh, and uh, look forward to your introductory remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Revere. Thank you very much. And thank you, first of all, for your kind words in the lo about our, the loss of Jim here from our mission, which is a huge loss. And, and uh, it's difficult to continue the circumstances, but I think we are right to, to, to do so. Uh, I'm very glad that we have Ambassador Prasad joining us and also uh, one of my heroes, uh, I'm sure to a lot of people on this call, Mary Robinson um, from the Elders. And also, I suppose we're very lucky. I'm looking forward to listening to, to but Sophia, Horaria and Nesreen and to listen from, to their perspectives. I think that's the really useful and important part of today's proceedings. I really appreciate the, the uh, work of the co-organizers, Fiji, the George, your own Georgetown Institute for Peace, for Women, Peace and Security, and for the Seropodos International for their convening of this uh, discussion. And it's an important time. We need this topic to be discussed. Fiji, we know, has been a, a long been a leading voice in highlighting the links between climate change and security. The Georgetown Institute is at the cutting edge of research into the disproportionate impacts of climate change on women and girls. And Seropodos International and civil society more broadly have long highlighted the intersection in these, in these two issues. We also in Ireland, I think, have a long standing interest in this area. As members of the Security Council, I think it's absolutely correct that we prioritize both women, peace and security and the climate and security agendas. In particular, we've been at the forefront of the efforts along with Niger, Niger to progress a resolution on climate security and security at the Security Council. The draft re resolution, which was tabled by Ireland, Ireland and Niger in December last year, aimed to strengthen the Council's ability to better un understand and address climate-related security risks within its mandate. In particular, 
The draft resolution recognized the role of women in peace building efforts and sustaining peace, as well as decision making processes related to climate and security. Unfortunately, despite huge support from across the membership of the UN, the resolution did not carry due to the use of the veto by, by Russia. Scope and severity of security risks that we face are intensifying due to climate change. And whether conflict has just broken out or is already entrenched, it significantly affects the ability of individuals and communities to adapt to the climate change that's already happening. This creates a destructive cycle between climate and conflict, which must be broken. As United Nations Security Council Resolution 2242 recognizes, climate change is an important con consideration for women and girls in the context of peace and security. The reality of the nexus of these issues is borne out across the world, particularly in a ready fragile context. In Afghanistan, Yunacha, has reported that 95% of the population is not eating enough food, with that percentage rising to almost 100% for female-headed households. Climate change and drought in Afghanistan has exacerbated humanitarian and other crises in the country, with women and girls already impacted by the Taliban, Taliban's systematic erosion of their rights suffering the most. We look forward to hearing more from Herrera on these points. In the, in the Pacific, as Ambassador Prasad knows, displacement and forced migration are risks resulting in part from sea level rise and reduced productivity from marine and land resources. Again, these challenges disproportionately affect women, girls and youth, particularly those who've been displaced and therefore face, face heightened risks of sexual and gender-based violence. However, as we are discussing today, Women and girls are not passive victims of the climate crisis and of fra fragility. They're also agents of, agents of change. And in this regard, I was most interested to note the finding in the re recent International Panel on Climate Change report, that despite the fact that women are working to reduce climate-related security risks by entering local, po local politics and joining community-based organizations, Gender-led analysis are not yet widespread in work on climate and security. That's an important finding. It represents a key opportunity for strengthening our toolbox on climate and security and filling evidence gaps to ensure more gender responsive climate action. It tells us that we need to ensure that we are creating pathways for women and girls to fully and meaningfully part participate in decision-making processes. It tells us that we also need to listen to the knowledge that exists among women and in, in Indigenous communities in tackling climate change and climate-related risks. Ireland is supporting efforts in this regard through our support for the UN's climate security mechanism, and particularly a climate security advisor in the UN mission in South Sudan, we are looking to identify opportunities to harness the peace building potential of women. Through our work with the Reading Weathering Risk Institute, gender sensitive research methods are ensuring that we better understand the different risks and dimensions of resilience across context and actor groups. This is of course only a start. And I hope that today's discussion will point to further ways forward to advance this critical work. Time is not on our side. You asked the question earlier as we were preparing for this meeting, Ambassador Revere, are we, are we making progress? Are, is time on our side? Clearly not. Clearly we have to accelerate and not use the war that's going on in Europe at the moment as a, in my mind, a, a, the answer to that cannot be further reliance on fossil fuels and the cause of this problem. We have to use it as a means, not just to try and build peace, but also to try and accelerate the action we need to take climate, which without which there will be no peace on our planet. And I think today's meeting and listening to the voices of those in the front line in this cause is a really useful uh, addition to the, to the efforts we need to make. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister Ryan, and thank you for really setting the context uh, for this discussion today, for underscoring the security issue that it is and its relationship uh, really to Security Council Resolution 1325. This is <clears throat> among all the other issues, uh, consequences of climate change. It does affect peace and security as you so well said. You mentioned that our 
keynote speaker is a hero and she is a hero to all of us for sure. I'm very pleased to be able to um, now introduce a, a woman who really needs not much of an introduction, the former president of Ireland and current chair of the elders, which is a group of global leaders working for peace, justice and human rights around the world. Mary Robinson has previously served as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, later a Special Envoy for Climate Change and Special Envoy for the Great Lakes Region. As if that weren't enough, she founded Climate Justice, which was focused on thought leadership, education and advocacy to secure global justice for the most vulnerable who are impacted by climate change. Mary is a trailblazer. She is indefatigable. Uh, and we are so pleased to have, us, have her with us today. Uh, we're always delighted when we can collaborate with her. Uh, so without further ado, Madam President, uh, the platform is yours. Thank you very much, Milan, for that warm introduction. I'm very pleased to be on this panel, but I too have to begin with expressing my deep shock and sorrow at learning of the sudden death of Jim Kelly. Sorry, I actually worked with Jim quite a lot, um, particularly leading up to Ireland's um, membership of the Security Council, but every time I've been to New York, um, so I feel very much for his family and for his colleagues. And uh, it's a sad day. Yesterday we had Patrick's Day, I'm still wearing green. We were, you know, on top of the world as the Irish are on Patrick's Day. And today we have uh, a shock and sorrow to cope with, but it mustn't distract us from the importance of this panel. I really would like to thank the co-sponsors, Ireland, Fiji, the Georgetown Institute uh, for uh, Women, Peace and Security, your institute, Milan, and the Seroptimus for a very, very good choice of theme within an already welcome choice of CSW 66. The fact that it was focusing on gender responsive climate action is extremely important and very timely. And now we have this particular focus on women and girls as agents of change in climate related conflict. Women and girls are agents of change, but they're not visible. They're often invisible, under-resourced, um, under thought about, um, not at the table, even in peacekeeping. And so that has to change. But when they are at the table, look at that recent success, which your institute, Milan, the Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security had a big role in uh, helping Afghan women to impact significantly on the Security Council and get a much better resolution on the, um, uh, you know, the on UNAMA than would otherwise have happened. This is not a good climate in the Security Council. It was their voices, their urgency, their passion, which made a difference. That's what we're talking about. That when women can get to the table, the difference it will make. And there really is a problem there. Um, there's a problem um, which I saw in the recent COP um, 26 in Glasgow. Um, the United Kingdom had said they wanted the most diverse, the most inclusive COP, but it wasn't. Uh, they weren't inclusive in their top people involved. I called it, which was true, it was too male, um, too pale and too stale. Um, and I understand that COVID didn't help, I, I accept that. But even so, um, there really wasn't a concerted effort. And now we're going to have COP27 in Egypt in November, an African COP. And I really hope, and I have some um, expectation in a way, a very good minister for the environment. And I understand that Egypt is going to appoint special envoys on civil society and on youth. Nisren, Nisren um, of Sudan will probably be able to tell us a bit more about this. But participation is really important. At COP26, 33% um, of the formal positions were held by women and 39% um, of women were leading delegations. That's better than when I was there in Copenhagen in 2009. There's no doubt about it. Um, I remember then uh, being shocked at how scientific and technical and frankly male dominated um, the uh, conference on climate was with no reference to gender and human rights. And you'll recall, Milan, the following year, we formed the network of women leaders on gender and climate. 
And you'll remember how we planned to get a decision on parity in climate contexts to have parity is 50-50 of representation in delegations and on committees, et cetera. And then uh, we, we worked with a, a constituency on the um, uh, gender action plan and then the enhanced work on that gender action plan. But one of the things we were also keen to do, and I think it was very important, because many of the women on our network were ministers of uh, um, energy, ministers of environment, uh, ministers of foreign affairs in some cases, they were heads of their delegation. So they could decide who would be at the table. And if we're talking about agents of change, they have to be at the table. And it did make a big difference. I remember it very well. It did make a very big difference um, to climate discussions when people like Constance O'Kellett in her low, powerful voice would speak about the devastation of her village in Uganda, in Eastern Uganda in 2007, and how she had to fight back with nothing and make herself resilient and show that women coming together could make a difference. And um, that's a story that we need to hear far more about. We don't have enough data on the work on the ground that women are doing in the context of both climate and conflict. If we had more of that data, and I honor the Georgetown Institute, I was saying this to you privately, I now say it publicly, for the wonderful work you are doing um, on providing that data um, on women, peace and security, and now confl um, climate um, related conflict and, and climate justice. And I'm so pleased that that is happening. Uh, you referenced the fact that I had my mandate um, in 2013, 2014, um, as the UN uh, Secretary General, Special Envoy for the Great Lakes in Africa. When Ban Ki-moon told me that I was the most senior woman in mediation, and he really hoped that I would give the kind of leadership he wanted, I tried very hard, and it was very difficult. And I acknowledge, again, support from the Georgetown Institute and others um, in trying to uh, ensure that women would be at the table. Uh, the, the, the 13 heads of state that I was dealing with were all men. They appointed a technical committee of all men. I had to bring in Binta Diop of Fam Africa Solidarity, who had her own mandate as the representative of the uh, African Commission on Women, Peace and Security. Um, so she then became part of that technical committee. And then we formed um, a group of uh, a, a, a grassroots um, women's um, groups from uh, the DRC, from Rwanda, from Uganda, um, from, uh, uh, and we, we, we tried to, um, show bottom up that women's voices mattered, that women's work mattered. And then I was switched to climate before Paris. So um, it, it wasn't possible to sustain as much as I would have liked personally that work. The women's um, groups are still continuing and I'm, I'm very glad to say. Um, what, what, what needs to happen? What needs to happen is um, really putting um, gender equality full and center in tackling the problems of conflict and the problems of climate. And it's absolutely vital that we do so and that we resource women and girls to be at the table so that their voices will be heard. And that does require resourcing. And I'm afraid, again, the picture is not very positive there. For example, if you look at um, climate finance itself, um, the actual amount of climate finance um, that philanthropists, for example, direct to um, uh, um, uh, women gender related um, climate is about 1.5% um, uh, of their funding. The funding that gets to women's groups on the ground is 0.2%, 0.2%, it is nothing. And it's because it's difficult. Um, and that's true of the broader climate finance as well. Um, uh, those who want to finance climate want to finance big mega projects. That gets the money out. Um, women don't deal with that. They deal with small projects. And one of the most successful uh, funders of women, and we need to learn from that, is the Green, uh, um, uh, um, um, green Grants um, uh, Fund, um, Global Green Grants Fund. I'm a patron of it, and I'm sure you're, you're also supportive of it, Milan. They don't ask for reporting by the women's groups that they uh, fund, they validate them with those in the area who will know, yes, this is an excellent women group, fund them for what they prioritize. Don't contort them 
to your agenda, fund them for what they want to do. And this is what makes the difference that um, you, you have, and, and the Global Green Grants Fund has really been able to fund a significant amount, as has the fund, Global Fund for Women and some other, um, some other funds, philanthropies that now work on climate justice, like the Oak Foundation. We, we need this leadership in showing that if you fund women, they will become even more visible as the agents of change. But I refuse to say they're not visible. I mean, uh, I wrote my book on um, climate justice, hope, resilience, and the fight for a sustainable future about uh, 11 stories, and nine of them were about women who so impressed me with what they were doing. I must tell the ambassador of Fiji, I think I've already told him um, this story, of going to Fiji in my mandate, a special envoy um, of the Secretary General on Climate Change before Paris. And actually, after the conference I attended, which was the conference of um, Pacific um, states, um, uh, without their two big brothers or sisters, um, Australia and, and, and New Zealand, their own um, uh, forum um, as uh, Pacific Island states, and they were very outspoken and it was very interesting. But afterwards, I went to a small project um, about making a community resilient, and it was all about women. It was women because they stay in the village. It was women because they took the training um, they did the um, self-help, the medical training. They had torches, they had equipment. They wanted more, but the point was they were the front line. They were the front line as they are in so many places. So um, how do we make women and girls as agents of change visible in climate um, uh, uh, related uh, conflict? Because they're there anyway. Uh, we make them visible through having more focus of resources in particular. Now, one of the decisions taken at COP26 was to double adaptation finance by 2025. That is extremely important, but I'm afraid as yet, as far as we can discern, there is no real roadmap. And it's, it's, it's a bit in the um, category of the 100 billion a year that was promised in Copenhagen, and we still haven't fully delivered on it. It will be it will break trust of developing countries if we don't work much harder to get that adaptation finance, because that's the finance that matters to communities. If uh, This is one of the last points I'll make, um, uh, Milan. If it hadn't been for this tragic and terrible war in Ukraine, which of course must have our close attention and our empathy and our support and our um, everything that it takes and uh, Ireland and other countries are showing that very generously. If it hadn't been for that, we would be focused on the report on the last day of February of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is a truly frightening report. It is a report that tells us how bad the climate impacts are now all over the world and how they are impacting still more severely the poorest in countries, the poorest communities, the small island states, the indigenous peoples, etc., and that we are reaching tipping points and that we are not on course for a safe world. And these are, this is the crisis that we have to keep in the front of our minds together with doing as much as we can to end that terrible war and invasion in Ukraine and bring it to an end as soon as possible and learn lessons, as um, Minister Ryan was saying, of moving in uh, much more of a kind of um, uh, uh, you know, a way that reflects a, a moonshot approach towards clean energy in Europe and elsewhere. Um, we have no time to um, try to solve with fossil fuel. Let's get out of fossil fuel and solve with clean energy. But let's, let's recognize that women and girls are the agents for change. And if we would make them more visible, they would be more powerful, they would be more proactive, they would achieve more, and we would get where we need to be. And I'll end with the words of Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it is done. That's something we need to absolutely do now. Well, thank you so much, Mary. As always, a call to action. Uh, we've got to get this done, the urgency of the now. Uh, but really also thank you for underscoring uh, the role that women are playing, even though we all don't know about it as much as we should. Uh, because the lessons that we can learn can be scaled. Uh, and I look forward to the panel now that will follow because they are uh, on the front line and they can uh, provide us uh, with many of those examples. 
data is critically important. Creating the evidence-based case is critically important. Uh, and our audience, as well as we, will continue to, to work on those issues. Um, and thank you, too, for underscoring climate finance, because uh, women are shortchanged. And in the process of shortchanging, uh, the women who can be making a difference even more significantly than they are, uh, we are shortchanging progress on this issue. So thank you again, Mary, and so for so many reasons uh, and for being with us today. Uh, we're gonna turn now to Nazreen uh, El Sahim, a leading environmental and climate activist in Sudan. She is the chair of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change as well as the chair of the Sudan Youth Organization on Climate Change. She's been a tireless advocate despite her young years. Uh, she's been unstinting in the work that she's been doing for global action on climate with a focus on women's and youth empowerment. She's the general coordinator of Youth and Environment Sudan, where she works to give youth involved in climate efforts the tools that they need uh, to be even more effective advocates. Uh, she also serves as a junior negotiator uh, with the African Group of Negotiators uh, and was recently uh, at COP26. We saw each other at COP26. Uh, and I can say that, uh, Nazreen, you issued a very powerful call to action there. And we're happy to have you with us uh, today. I want to ask you two questions, but let's take them one at a time. Uh, first, have, what connections have you seen uh, between gender, climate, and conflict in Sudan? Uh, how are women making contributions uh, to climate re resolution, to climate resilience? And was this factored in? Were those contributions factored in uh, to Sudan's peace process? Thank you very much. I am very glad to be here today with you. Um, well, to respond to your question, the connections as I see it and I live it every day in my country, Sudan, is very obvious. And that's why I feel so sorry to have this denial of the connection between climate change, peace and security. It reminds me of the days where we had denial on climate change itself. But as Mary Robinson mentioned already, data and science proved it. And to end that the huge gap and there's a huge change that's called climate change and will cause damage to our future and our planet. Well, I'm sure that the science also is now proving that very clear connection between climate change, peace and security. I hope by the time we get all of the data and all of the researches, it's not too late. Um, very few institutes, very few people, very few organizations are really investing in collecting data and doing research about climate change, peace and security. And now even adding more aspect to this, which is the gender aspect. And that's why I was so happy to get an invitation for this event, especially after reading the report and the study that your university, your institute actually made uh, on the connection between climate change, peace and security and its relations to gender. Again, as the call I launched at COP26, I launched another call for everyone listening to me to have more investment in research, in data collection, in documentary movies. Maybe it doesn't have to be a big movie, just collecting testimonies, seeing how people are adapting, seeing the real causes of the conflict, how everything sparked at the beginning, and how big the dimensions of the conflict over natural resources are, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa, especially in the very vulnerable communities, and especially in the continents that depends on natural resources. From my country, from what I see, uh, there are four ways how climate change is impacting peace and security, and how this impacts in gender, women, girls, young people. Well, first of all, we live 70% on the Sudanese population depends on natural resources. And I mean by that agriculture, pasteurism, water that falls from the sky that we call rain. So with climate change, everything became very much little or very much too much actually. If we have too much rain, then it's a flood. Flood mean that farms will go, cattle will die, house will be destroyed 
and a lot of people will have to be internally displaced to another big place which is a bit higher or a bit drier than the area that got flooded and then when we talk about moving people from area to another area what do we expect that will take them to an area that they can actually have their normal life practices of agriculture of housing etc etc and this area is normally inhabited by another group of people who are also suffering from the very little resources that they have because of the same factor of climate change. A conflict might appear there. The second way, we have two uh, main jobs, which is pastoralism and agriculture, farmers and pastoralists. Normally in the normal situation, we have winter, we have spring, we have the rainy season, and then we have summer. So the normal cycle is that the farmers prepare the land in the winter, the pastors come with their cuttles, they, they actually cultivate the land with the cuttles uh, hoofs, and they actually do the normal fertilization process with the cuttles also to the land, and the cuttles move to the south. Then, they actually start seeding. They start to put the seeds in the land and then the rainy season come and it irrigates all of the agricultural lands that we have. Now we have the harvest time. The farmers collect all of the cash crops. It's almost summer. So now pastors need to move again back to the north. So they come back to the north. They repeat the same cycle by eating the leftovers uh, cultivating the land and um, with their hooves and also doing the recycling nutritious process with the cuttles and the farmers. And then they go back to their area. Now we don't have something called seasons. Winter is almost none. There is no winter. Summer comes very early. Rainy season comes very late. Everything is so mixed up together. What happens is that the cattle eats the cash crops, the farmers kill the cattle, the pastor kill the farmer, the farmer tribe kill the pastor, the pastor tribe start another conflict with the farmer tribe. I can go ahead and explain many, many ways on how climate change is actually causing conflicts and severe conflicts, not only small size conflicts. In my country and other countries, they have the same context. But for the interest of time, I will stop here and I hope my message is clear. Your message is very clear, Nazreen, and, and really brings into perspective just how real uh, these connections are. I wonder very quickly if you could uh, touch on the role of grassroots women peace builders and how they can be better included into climate actions. Well, actually, uh, women who work in climate advocacy and building the resilience of the communities are not peace builders. I call them conflict preventers because they don't build the peace after the conflict happened. They actually prevent the conflict from happening in the first place. They started, yeah, they started very brilliant water harvesting processes. They also uh, work hand in hand with all of the community when the rainy season is heavy to actually have a drainage to the extra water so it doesn't actually um, impact the land. They also educate a lot of people. Yet the question is, how can we help them to improve their skills, to have an early warning system so they understand what to do, uh, and also how to help them financially not to be dependent on the other factors of the community and not be to be very, very vulnerable to climate change and for climate crisis. Again, I am here um, volunteering for serving other communities and my community also in empowering more women, young uh, ladies and young women also and youth to be this conflict preventers because of course prevention is better than cure all the time. Um, and I'm asking everyone here in this session who's with me. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll get back to you in the Q&A, but let me turn now to Poria uh, Faizi Sar Sarjarsada, uh, an Afghan leader dedicated to gender equality and engaging women in sustainable energy through entrepreneurship. Uh, Horia advanced this work through her roles as Director General of Early Childhood Care and Education at the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. 
She did it as Deputy Program Director of Women's Economic Empowerment, National Priority Program for the World Bank in Afghanistan, and also as an expert for gender within UN Women at the Office of the Afghan President on UN Affairs. Horia founded at Women's Initiatives for Sustainable Energy. This is another really important area. Uh, and through her work, she has significantly increased the involvement of women in the energy sector that, as we all know, is largely dominated uh, by men. Uh, unfortunately, she recently was forced to leave Afghanistan and is temporarily in Albania, but we are so fortunate to have you with us, Horia. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit uh, to Afghanistan's vulnerability to climate change. I don't think that is something that is well understood, uh, the toll it's already taking and how it impacts uh, women and girls um, and how you've seen the connection given your work uh, between women's roles in sustainable energy uh, and peace and uh, security outcomes. So Horia, good to have you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Milan. It's a, it's such a pleasure, and, and and I feel really wonderful being here, especially hearing from Nasreen, hearing from uh, Her Excellency Mary, and also from Ambassador Rian. Uh, it's it's such a, a wonderful uh, flow to to speak about this uh, uh, issue. At the same time, I'm I'm really thankful that you people are bringing someone from Afghanistan on this table because one of the issues that has not been spoken and not having uh, quite and required attention is about the climate change and the conflict, ongoing conflict in Afghanistan and how we can see it from the gender lens as well. So Afghanistan being as a uh, lower income country uh, is right now at the burnt of, burnt of the uh, climate change. The people are having more media is having more focus on um, the humanitarian assistance and the situation is there, but they are forgetting about the last drought that we had last year and the drought that is coming and been projected for the next year. The farmers are shouting about that. And uh, Afghanistan is one of those 20 countries that are in the list of most vulnerable countries when it comes to climate change. And unfortunately, it's again under that list that beside having this issue of climate change, it has an ongoing conflict also in the ground. So, uh, but while it's one of those countries that is least responsible for uh, uh, raising the CO2 emissions, uh, so we can see that all these situations that are too cross-cutting with each other, but at the same time, it's so interesting that how they are connecting climate change, the recent changes in the government of Afghanistan, the after COVID-19 and during the, the new wave of the COVID-19, uh, political instability, so and the continuing conflict on the ground in Afghanistan, and how the situation is being so complicated and what we can expect for the upcoming year and upcoming months, especially the six months. You have been, I'm sure that you have been with the uh, heard of these reports regarding the droughts, the floods, the last year, the Amgarsan, and the ones that have been projected for the coming year. So we have uh, been heard of the uh, reports about the areas that are important for uh, uh, as farmlands in Afghanistan, and we have a declined spring raining in those areas. The same time, we have uh, 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 those farmers that are not being recovered from the 2018 uh, drought, and right now they need to be uh, uh, prepared for the coming drought. And also, we have this uh, um, flood issue as well. 80% of Afghanistan population are fully dependent on their agriculture. So their main income resources, uh, agriculture. And uh, the same time, there is an issue with the not having proper access to the clean uh, uh, drinking water. And so just concluding all these points, the uh, vulnerability of Afghanistan is high level for climate change and the impacts of climate change on Afghanistan having these social economic uh, uh, effects. We can uh, include it in agriculture and irrigation, in water resources, livelihood, social protection, even in energy sector. So if we just uh, divide those impacts on the people of Afghanistan, with, with the whole uh, population that we have. So we will have the uh, food insecurity in Afghanistan. You have been recently heard from the United Nations about the food insecurity that how uh, percent of Afghanistan is vulnerable for that as well. 
especially women and children. Uh, we have the health issues because when there is flood, then we have the spread of disease and also it's a human health issue. When we have drought, this is the food production issue and the human health issue as well. So, and also we have this issue of limiting the uh, uh, worker production as well. So coming back to the gender lens, if we see uh, this situation from a gender lens that how it impacts the Afghan women and Afghan girls, we can say that women and children, according to the studies that have been done, the research been done, and the reports that lately been published on the Shaidai camp, if you have heard of that from Herat, that most of the immigrants there are the ones that have been uh, fleed due to the uh, uh, climate disasters. Those are the women and children that they are in high risk of GBV, early childhood marriages, and also the uh, lack of economic opportunities because children are losing their uh, schools and they are missing their school just to do some work for receiving some small amount of wage, uh, wages. Uh, so um, we do have some strong, uh, unfortunately, uh, data that it claims that how women and, and, and children specifically, uh, and girl children, they are vulnerable to the uh, climate change because the climate change have the forced immigrations and those immigrations uh, uh, connected with the uh, uh, with the conflict context, it lead to uh, those problems. They would have less uh, job opportunities. They would have they would have less uh, uh, education opportunities as well, and it would lead also to the health issues that they would not have a, a, a proper access to the required uh, services there. So uh, for those who, uh, that been immigrated to those uh, displaced camps, we have unfortunately proper reports and those that uh, we can we can look at it at all those details i'll just stop here to just keep in mind the time yeah thank you horia could i ask you also briefly uh, if you could talk to international policymakers about what they could do to ensure uh, that women are central to climate change solutions and how to advance that what would you advise them uh, thank you very much. Uh, I believe there are a lot of um, research and studies being done that they provided the recommendation and there are different calls from uh, uh, change leaders as Nasreen mentioned. There's a wonderful study, it's also been shared in the chat by uh, Georgetown Institute that, that shared the recommendation to be considered. But beside that, I would like to have some specific points. My first point will be to the, exist the existing policies and strategies need to be climate uh, uh, Approved and also gender responsive, especially it needs to be localized. Because when we are talking about gender responsive, it means that we need to recognize the impacts of climate change on the issues like GBV, early childhood marriages, uh, uh, less educational opportunities, less economic opportunities, and that. Uh, there's also a call on government and the responsive organization on the ground that they are working uh, in, in emergency situation, especially on climate emergencies, to provide and to make ensure the protection and safety of women and girls in such situation before the uh, climate crisis, during and after those crises. Those sort of services could be to provide them uh, basic services and also food, health, and the rest of the things that a woman and a girl may face during those days. The other point could be that to include women in the local level as a change leader to provide them with the required knowledge and training where they could take the initiative themselves and they can talk and they can lead those initiatives locally how to be part of those uh, uh, programs. Uh, the, another call is on the wealthy countries, the ones that are more responsible for the changes and for war warming the, the planet to uh, just please meet their commitments. Just please follow their commitment, the commitments that they had to keep the global warming low. And the second thing, to also please think of those countries that have been attacked so badly from climate change, the countries that are having lower incomes, the countries that are underdeveloping countries like Afghanistan, to consider them in this hunger and hardship situation and to uh, have some specific program designed for those countries. Those programs could be the ones to have the approach at the same time, humanitarian approach and also the development approach in order to help those people to be prepared and to able to how to adjust with this uh, global uh, warming. The other call is about 
the global, all these uh, efforts and the uh, uh, programs that they are about to have to please consider it in a feminist way, in a way to have women in the center. I'm fully agreed with Her Excellency Mary Robinson that she mentioned that it has to be uh, as gender centered and it has to be in a feminist way to, to uh, consider having women supporting women lead organization, the organization that they are there, uh, there and they are working. And also to consider the natural resource management as Nasreen mentioned, it's also the important point that how we can include women in this discussion and how it's a technical discussion, but beside that we can prepare our women to be expert in decision as well and to uh, manage it properly. Uh, so those could be the points that, according to me, and as of my experience in Afghanistan, could be the ones to be considered. Well, thank you so much, Horia. Uh, so we're going to go now from the experience uh, that she described in Afghanistan uh, to Kenya and to Sophia Kipkoish, who is with Soroptimist International and the Kenya Project Management Group. Uh, Sophia has led a range of projects focused on peace building, climate change, and the environment, and provided training to local women on peace and conflict resolution during times of political upheaval in Kenya. Furthermore, in the Culture for Peace, Trees for Peace project, she used the universal challenge of climate change uh, to highlight common experiences of communities working in collaboration with local administration and has helped to provide education and training to women, worked with them on tree planting and sustainable farming and distribution of solar lights, all of which are critically important. So Sophia, let me ask you about how you see the connections between gender equality, climate change um, and security uh, in your work. Um, and tell us about what your organization does in sustainable farming and agriculture, because that's a very big area uh, for climate change, um, changes that, that would uh, eliminate some of the serious problems contributing to climate change. And in that context about um, sustainable uh, farming and agriculture, maybe you could give us some concrete examples so we can really understand how all of this fits together. So Sophia, on to you. Thank you, Amb Ambassador Malin. I'm pleased to be part of this uh, panel. First of all, our condolences from uh, our president, SI, sort of Optimist International Kenya, and uh, my president from Eldoret, Winnie, for the, to the family of Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Jim Kelly. As you've heard, my name is Sophia. I'm a member of Soroptimist International Club of Eldoret. SI, SI works in over 3,000 communities focusing on three thematic areas, peace, human rights, and sustainable development. Eldoret is a cosmopolitan area. And during each election cycle, during each election cycle, it suffers a great appeal. After the election of 2007, Eldoret was one of the worst hit regions in the country that saw over 1,000 women, uh, people displaced from their homes. Environmental challenges affect everyone regardless of what tribe you come from, it, it also provides an opportunity to unite a potentially divided community. So as sort of optimists, we came together and assisted the communities which were fighting after the election and during the election. Working in various projects, first of all, we had to provide first to, uh, during that, uh, during the election, we had to provide counseling to the women who are in the camps. And immediately after the election, we came up with a project which were with the support of various uh, organizations, women and climate change, which encourages community members to plant trees. And in turn, they get a gift, which was a solar lantern. And in some cases, 
a rainwater harvesting and fireless cooker. All this saves on energy and clean energy. And we also trained women on clean production, saving of water, reuse of water. And in all this, bringing all communities together to work together in all these projects as a, as a community, as a team, regardless of which community you came in from. So, so for every tree, regardless, we, we encourage them to plant trees, exotic, indigenous or free trees. I'm glad to report to this panel and to the, whoever is con connected this evening, that women are now eating fruits from the fruit trees they planted, which is, a, a, which is good for us. The club would provide a solar lamp in cases and water, water harvesting. This doubled the environment benefit, environmental benefits. Not only do trees help limit desertification and observe carbon, but the solar lamps help to reduce reliance to kerosene and also save them on buying the kerosene, which in turn, they would use the money for buying kerosene in other, in doing other things. We also did the clean kitchen, indoor pollution. We eliminated indoor pollution and reduced on use of firewood by having Letting training women on how to make improved jikos, improved cooking stoves, connected, fully connected with a chimney, and their kitchens are free of smoke. And their student, the students can now learn using the solar lantern even in the kitchen without smoke, and the communities are thriving. We also introduced uh, kitchen gardens in every homestead we work to. They now have vegetables, they don't need to buy vegetables anymore. Mm -hmm. So under, under smart agriculture, we trained women. We trained women whom we worked with on smart farming and we gave them uh, a seed, farm inputs, and the yield doubled. We did a baseline survey, survey first, and after the, the, the harvest, after training, there was a double harvest. And uh, all this assisted farmers in various ways. Thank you for all those Thank you. concrete examples of, of, of what difference it's been making for uh, the women and for uh, eliminating some of the worst consequences of climate change. We're going to come back to you, Sophia, uh, but let me go uh, before the Q&A uh, to Ambassador Satyendra Prasad, who is the permanent representative of Fiji uh, to the United Nations. He's been leading global efforts to address, address threats to peace and security, particularly arising from the climate crisis. Earlier, he worked as CEO of the Papua New Guinea Governance Facility uh, and as a senior advisor to the World Bank, as well as the United Kingdom's Department for International Development. He also chairs the Pacific Small States, uh, where he advises uh, Pacific governments on climate and oceans, uh, issues uh, with respect to the uh, UN role and other multilateral settings. Uh, so Ambassador, we're very pleased to have you with us and to bring the perspective of the Pacific Islands uh, to this discussion, because uh, you truly are on the front line. Thank you very much. Uh... Ambassador Bibi and uh, to uh, fantastic uh, panelists, uh, Minister Ryan and uh, 
uh, President Mary Robinson, uh, wonderful to see you all. And uh, I also share my condolences uh, to our dear colleague and to our Irish mission and uh, to the families. Please uh, do convey our very sincerest uh, condolences. Uh, and uh, I, it, it's, uh, it would be a bit, uh, I, I don't really have much to add after such a fantastic panel, uh, uh, Ambassador Melanie, that you have put, uh, put together, who have uh, uh, given so, uh, such rich insights into how climate and security impacts and aggravates every inequality, including gender inequality and the, the circumstances for women and girls are worse off. And this is true in Sudan, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, in uh, Afghanistan. It is equally true in small island states uh, across the world and uh, equally true uh, in the Pacific. I'll make a few ge uh, general remarks. Uh, uh, I think in the climate and security nexus, every phenomena that is an element of the climate and security nexus impacts upon men and women differently. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, Nazarene, thank you very much for spelling it out. The experience of flood uh, between men and women are felt and girls and boys are felt differently. The experience of food insecurity is felt differently. The experience of access to health is felt uh, differently. Uh, the experience of uh, displacement is uh, felt differently. And then when you put all of these things together, they are multiplied so many, uh, so many more uh, fold. Let me give uh, a bit of a personal example after, since COVID, uh, uh, I, I had the uh, good fortune of uh, traveling back home to Fiji about three weeks ago, and I've just come back. And in the uh, one or two days that I went to my island, uh, which is one of the many islands, I visited a, a village uh, that uh, about five years ago, Fiji had our government had earmarked to uh, relocate fully, that the whole village on the coastal area was being inundated, salt water intrusions, and uh, 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 then uh, what is the experience in this uh, is a small village uh, on, on uh, Vanualevu between men and women? And I'll try to spell it out, and I hope it brings some sense of uh, how the gender differences work out. When uh, livelihoods be begin to become unsettled because of slow onset climate change. It doesn't happen on one day, it happens over decades. Uh, young men are likely to leave the village because their farms are no longer providing the livelihoods. At some point, uh, uh, the uh, men are lost from uh, villages because they, have, uh, they move to the urban areas in search of uh, wage, uh, wage work and they either remit uh, uh, money back to their families or they don't. And so, uh, as uh, at the same time, the communities get more and more exposed to climate vulnerabilities, to sea level rise, their, uh, their livelihoods are lost, their agricultural farming products are lost. The small access that they have to markets, for example, is also eroded because in this village, I went to two or three of the connecting bridges uh, were washed away. And so where uh, this was 30 minute uh, a journey to a market that became a two to three day journey to the market to take uh, a sack full of, of goods to the market to get some uh, cash income. Uh, so women, uh, in the, the conclusion I drew from that, women are not uh, on the front lines of climate change, women are on the back lines of climate change uh, as well. They are the last people standing. The men have left, the young men leave first, the older men leave later, uh, boys have probably left as, uh, and women hold uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fort uh, uh, with the young children. Uh, and uh, that uh, struck to me dramatically. And I, I, I told uh, these folks uh, who hosted me very generously, uh, you know, I'm tired of saying these things. Where do you want me to say this? <laughs> and they said, just say it again. So I've said it again. Uh, so uh, then uh, let me come to the second part. Of it. What should we be doing about this? And uh, thank you very much, Ireland and Niger for pushing the climate security. Uh, and I, I know that the Security Council is not doing its job on this. It's not doing its job on many other things as well as we are seeing right now. Uh, uh, but the CSW has given us a perspective uh, and, uh, and this, uh, this event has given us a perspective and a moment to uh, focus on the uh, the gender elements of climate and security. And thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for the uh, fantastic work uh, that uh, your, your 
institute is doing in providing us with uh, a granular understanding and the data and the analytics uh, to, to make this case. In the instruments that are available at UN, I'll make three quick points and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, we have a peace building fund. I hope uh, that the peace building fund can be uh, supported uh, more generously. And that uh, as uh, uh, President Ma uh, Mary Robinson has said, uh, that it is able to provide resources to women very directly at very lo uh, local level in climate stressed uh, uh, circumstances that, uh, that we can really expand. The second part is that uh, we need within the UN, I'm talking about and there are many other instruments at play. Within the UN, we have uh, funds and programs at work, many funds and programs. Are we bringing sufficiently uh, the gender dimensions of climate and security into play? I'll give you another example, a quick example from my previous uh, past life. How is it uh, that uh, in a world food program, uh, when wheat, uh, when flour is uh, given to households, uh, that uh, the worst, uh, the, the sort of use, uh, use uh, where the use by date uh, has passed often goes to women held households and the men and uh, you know, uh, sort of regular families uh, get flour, which is still in. It's, uh, and uh, my conclusion of that is in about nine out of 10 times, even when we do everything right in climate and uh, security context, we, the outcome is wrong for women and girls in nine out of 10. Uh, turn time. So this allow uh, this across the UN funds and programs. We need that granular type of uh, uh, un understanding. And and so uh, CSW is a very hopeful hopeful moment for me. Thank you very much, Ireland, for uh, bringing this piece together. And uh, it would be remiss. Uh, it is a hopeful time. And uh, uh, after many years, uh, we have got CSW to focus on uh, on, on the challenge uh, before us and challenge of, of our lifetime. And it is one of those times that I think uh, by the end of next week, we can make hope and history right. And uh, this is our, our moment to uh, set it right. And I'm very hopeful uh, that uh, when the conversations uh, this week and next week are over, we will have a much uh, more granular understanding of how we need to uh, elevate uh, the gender impacts and gender, uh, flawed gender outcomes and the, and the very sad gender outcomes of the climate and security nexus. And thank you also to Afghanistan. It's fantastic to hear Afghanistan being spoken about in climate terms. Uh, we, uh, many of us uh, have been saying that for a long time that if some of the uh, big conflicts are spoken about from the climate and agenda lens, uh, the outcomes would have been very different if we had started with a different base. I think we started uh, uh, probably with a different, uh, different set of uh, parameters. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to such a well, region. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And, and we hope with you uh, that hope and history will certainly rhyme uh, in this case, and uh, we will make greater progress. But thank you for um, explaining the, the disparate impacts uh, that climate uh, consequences have uh, on women and men uh, for your very concrete example, and then for your recommendations, uh, all of which are well taken. So we thank you very much uh, for the leadership that you continue to provide. We're going to turn now to our question and answers from our uh, questions from our audience, answers from all of you. Uh, so I'll turn to Allie for the questions. Thanks, Milan. Uh, a question here for Nisreen Horia and Sophia on targeted climate financing and what you see as the priorities. It says, what are your top recommendations specifically for multilateral organizations and development banks to finance and support an inclusive approach to climate? What are the top priorities for targeted funding? And what do you see as the role of the private sector in this space? Who would like to start? Ms. Rain? Yes. Um, well, Mary already mentioned that almost 0.1 or 0.2% only goes to women and, and led organizations uh, in working on climate change. I can tell you that even half of this amount, which is only 0.1%, goes to youth-led organizations. So it's very clear that the most vulnerable are getting less uh, impact and less finance. Uh, 
Um, my recommendation to the bilateral organizations and the big banks is to lower the administrative cost. I can tell you, I've seen it different UN agencies in Sudan, different big organizations in Sudan. Uh, most of the fund goes in the administrative cost, in the uh, reporting in the uh, everything that doesn't actually goes to the beneficiary directly. So my problem right now is not how much money we have. I know there is money. It's the problem is the system, not only to get that money because accessing finance is very hard. Uh, the last report by the Green Climate Fund said that only 3% of funds went to Africa. Only 1% went to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So it, it tells us a very clear message that accessing fund is not easy even if the money is there and then how to distribute this fund is also a big question who's get what and how getting that this is a huge question not only for me but for many young uh, uh, climate advocates we need a system that works for us not only works for the reporting system because reports will not survive it's us human who will survive um, and that's it from my side well, that's that's very very good. Let's go to Horia as well. I know you wanted to comment. Yes, uh, Ambassador Mellon. Uh, regarding Afghanistan situation, when we have started our Women's Initiative for Sustainable Energy or Voice in Afghanistan, we were the first organization, and at the same time, we were the only organization that working for women's empowerment from through uh, sustainable energy. So we faced this same situation. There was no funding regarding that. The activities that they were interested to do funding was training, having some workshops and those stuff and instead of just going to the root cause, instead of just considering our proposal that we prepared, like providing rural women with some tools and some those stuff, they were mostly more focused on providing trainings and doing just on the surface, not going to the root of the, uh, the cause. And the second thing, they would have a list of requirements that okay you have to uh, have a five years of experience of working with, within the sustainable energy and and blah 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 so that requirements list need to also be relooked at it and re-review it and to consider instead of just they tell us that okay these are the sections that you need to work on it just come up to our situation that according to the need assessment that we have done from our localized situation from our perspective that what we want to do and to come up with the ideas that how they can support us how they can just provide us with some grants and some funds. And I'm fully agree regarding the administrative fund. Sometimes it's more than 60% or 70% in Afghanistan that the, the actual fund, the, the administrative fund, uh, the cost is so higher. So that point is also the another point that I wanted to share. Thank you. Sophia, did you want to come in on this as well? Yes, yes. Working with the grassroots women, we noted that uh, when women come together, they have, they have already their own structured ways of coming together to raise funds, to do very little like uh, welfare. Like in Kenya, we have the table banking. So if development partners can come, can come in and assist these women, finance or development partners can support the cooperative societies, which fund the women. This would go a long way. And also, as we come up with, the, when, when development partner or an international community comes in and supports the women through an organization like Sorotimist, they should work hand in hand with the women and the Sorotimist because we understand what goes on in the ground to be able to implement a sustainable action. Back to you, thank you. Well, thanks to each and every one of you. Unfortunately, uh, the clock is showing us that uh, we're out of time, uh, but I hope that uh, the time that we've spent together uh, for this program uh, will bring more, more people to the fore, more leaders to understand how important it is to, uh, uh, to have the participation of women and youth uh, as uh, solution experts, climate solvers in many ways, um, because we're not tapping 
uh, what they represent, uh, which is critical to the kinds of outcomes we all want to see. And I think it's been particularly healthy uh, that we've had so much focus on finance today because uh, there's not enough on it. We talk about it, but there is not uh, that kind of release of funding that recognizes why these investments are so critically important. <coughs> Excuse me. So to each and every one of you, uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you to the permanent missions of Ireland and Fiji, uh, to John Kilroy, to um, Minister Ryan, to President Robinson, uh, and of course to uh, our dear friends uh, from the grassroots who have brought us those lessons uh, that we often don't hear, certainly don't hear enough as to why we need to make investments uh, in the kinds of things that you do every day that make such a difference to Nazreen, to Horia, and to Sophia. So thank you to each and every one of you. I think it's clear that we must redouble and triple the efforts that we are making uh, because this is indeed a crisis that cries out um, for to each and every one of us, given the threat that it is. So thank you all. Ever onward. Thank you.